Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tommy Douglas Anderson, and I have the very great pleasure of being the Cultural Services Director for the City of Eugene and a deep lover of the practice of placemaking. Um, one of the um, great pleasures that I have is to spend the last year with city staff and others exploring how we could help create a placemaking program in our community and create awesome, wonderful places downtown that work for everyone. Um, and tonight I have the great pleasure uh, to introduce you to Fred Kent, who is the Pro Project for Public Spaces President. Uh, they are international experts in this work. They are a nonprofit firm that does this work, which is quite unusual. Um, as a model. They have a community-focused approach that is transformational. I've seen their work in cities, and it has been really, truly amazing, and I hope that we can come together tonight, learn more about what they do, push aside our cynicism, embrace our public spaces, and really create something awesome together. So, with great pleasure, Mr. Fred Kent. So, uh, Meg Walker's up here, and she'll probably say some things. Eric, he's just back there. Where is uh, Alessandra? Uh, and uh, Alessandra? I'm in our place laboratory. Oh, there's Alessandra. And uh, Bree. Where's Bree? And there's Bree back there. Okay, so those are all part of the team that are here. So tonight, I'm uh, trying to do is, having been here a while, and, and Meg and the rest of the team, here, I uh, have really learned a lot in the last day and a half, and I was here a couple of months ago to give a talk. I learned a lot then. So, and I did give a talk then. I'm trying to, and this is a different one. There's a little bit of a repetition, but not much. Uh, and I want to talk more about the future. So I don't want to get dragged into the past, or I really, and, and I, I'm open to having some discussion as we go through. So if you have something that is pressing, but I don't want to talk about the past because it was such a bright future. And that's what we've got to deal with. We've got a lot of problems to solve. But I'm going to be talking about how you can really create a stage or an atmosphere for change in the this, in this city. And the place making is good. And there is a lot, so much, so many aspects to this. So I will. Uh, You're having a little trouble. Is your mic on? Is that? No. Hey. Hey. It was not. Okay, well, okay. So uh, let's get started, and then uh, you know, please uh, keep a good discussion going, okay? Because that will draw out a lot of some things that the slides are meant to set up. So we've worked in a lot of places, uh, something like a thousand cities around the world, and uh, uh, day after tomorrow. We're going to Quito. We have worked there, there's no doubt there. But there's the UN Habitat uh, 3 conference there. And a lot of what Habitat 3 is going to be about is about public space and placemaking, which we've been working on for the last three years. So it's a very exciting moment for us. Uh, but I want to start with just some images uh, and quotes of Holly White that uh, I'll tell you about him as we go through. He was a great writer, and I used to sit, I used to have the office next to him. He was sort of a mentor, but I also worked with him for a while. And he would sit in the next room and he would talk out loud, because he would come up with quotes like, it's hard to create a space that will not attract people. What is remarkable is how often this has been accomplished. Okay, so that's pretty hard hitting, direct. And you've got some places like that, as you know. Uh, and then we've been working at Harvard, and we sort of have modified that, so it's hard to create a space that will attract people. What is remarkable is how seldom this has been accomplished. Okay, so and that's one of your issues. You have some very, very important spaces that are right for transformation, activation, and success. And that's what we're going to talk about, and that's why we're here. So, I always show this, I love this picture, because this only person that doesn't have ice cream <laughs> and that never has happened ever in my entire life. And I spent a lot of time in, around ice cream stands watching people eat ice cream. We have this phrase, as you can see, a lot just by observing. And there's nothing more fun than going to a place like an ice cream stand and watch how people eat ice cream. And so then I said, well, uh, this is a really good picture, so I better take another one. <laughs> and I, 
I don't know why he's looking at it, but he must know that I know that he does know ice cream. <laughs> and he's French, so we don't even speak the same language. So, and uh, if you want to see the place with activity, put out food. And I love these different images because, you know, they're all eating ice cream at the same time. Except for this guy. Or this is French fries. So, it's really fun. It's a great pastime to be a voyeur in the world. And then the other thing is, this is so good, it's the way it's written. It's one of the best things about water is the look and feel of it. It's not right to put water before people and then keep them away from it. So look at the, uh, the fountain in the park lots. It's a perfect example of one that you can't do. Look at it. And you know when something like this happens, is there, you're going to just get sucked into it or that. Uh, you can't stay away from it. And you'll come and even. And then another one, this is another wonderful way of saying it. Benches are artifacts, the purpose of which is to punctuate architectural photographs. They're not so good for sitting, right? So this is in front of a library in southern France. And you know it's not a place, it's a place you perch. You don't spend time there. It's not comfortable, it's not a social place, and it should be in front of a library. In Brooklyn, where I live, we have a bookstore, and this is the front of the bookstore. And you can't go by that store at all slow. You have to go slow. Not because you have to go slow, but it's interesting. And you're drawn to it, and you always see something, and you go slow enough to be able to pick up some stuff. So there are some ideas of what's going on. This kind of bookstore and could be over in the library, out on the street, and brought out into the public space there and activate that. And I'll talk more about that, too. So in a bench that's nine feet long is a very different dynamic than, a, uh, two, than four foot benches. So you know that someone's not going to come there easily and sit down. And she certainly doesn't want anyone to sit down. So, but here you can have uh, different groups of people on a nine foot bench. And then this is public seating in a city in Germany, and they, they're even out there in the rain. And you get some rain here, I guess, occasionally. Uh, so, but you don't use umbrellas. I learned that. I did burn one though. Uh, that's one of yours. <laughs> it doesn't rain, I guess. Really. And then this is my favorite bench. It's, there's some real good principles here. We call it, it's two backside street deep. So you can have one bun on this side and another bun on the other side, and sit back to back. And then uh, the way it's set up is that all these uh, little social networks. But we were there, and I know that the, this woman who was there listened to these people. Gone. So those are things happen. And this, this is a very weird shot, because if this were happening in Eugene, everyone would be watching us. But this is in Paris, and people totally ignore it. And then the bet, the what we've learned is that when people are comfortable, they take off their shoes. So this is probably a, a Guinness World Record of people taking off their shoes. But this is a very common sight in a good place. And it's really wonderful to watch. And, and here, you know, that it doesn't get better than that. Uh, or, and then people are affectionate in good places. You can always get uh, the numbers of, um, and a kind of affection is always abundant in good places. And these are three generations of women uh, sitting on a bench that someone donated in, a, in somewhere in Southern California. And then the whole idea of access. I just love those, those uh, planters and how they've taken a road which had traffic on it and just made it into a kind of a pathway down to the waterfront. Uh, and then and then, you know, these kinds of markets, and this is a, a kind of place in Valparaiso in southern Chile, but I thought it, it's really kind of worn out, but it's such a wonderful structure, to, and I've never seen anything like it, that where you can have a market, and you can have the shade, and you can have the, the rain issues, and so on. And then the way we can activate uh, empty spaces into <coughs> gathering spaces is really quite remarkable, and then the whole idea 
of what men do, and women too. I mean, we go this, this is in Paris, we go there a lot, and there are more and more women playing this game, but it's a real, it's wonderful to watch the professional, and some, and some of it's really amazing. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, the sandcastle, Ikea. Uh, and then uh, another quote of Holly Wikes is, the street is the river of life, the place where we come together, the pathway to the center. And so that's, a, that's something that wherever we go, we're always looking at a street and how it performs as a public space. And uh, I'm getting a little older. And I'm going to go around with my wife and other friends, and we're going to neck in public spaces around the world. Uh, and uh, I love this one here. Wouldn't you like to be kissed by a beautiful woman like that? <laughs> so kissing is something we're always looking at, where people kiss. It's important. And then this is a kind of evolution of something going on. Uh, and then this. <laughs> Amazing. This is up on Granville Island, and uh, this, and the reason I put this here is that this, we saw this happen around the block, and then we came around, and there was this woman, and you know they looked like the same woman. It's just the station here is a lot shorter than it usually is. So, uh, and then, and then this is one of my favorite pictures, you know. Here's obviously going to be a mayor or a director or something. Uh, got all the people on it. Right. So, uh, so really, all of this yeah, adds up to something that is so unbelievably special, and that is what he wrote. He says, "I end then in praise of small spaces. The multiplier effect is tremendous. It's not just the number of people using them, but the larger number who pass by and enjoy them vicariously, or even the larger number." who feel better about a city center for knowledge of them. For a city, such places are priceless, whatever the cost. They are built a set of basics, and they're right in front of our noses if we will look. So that's a very deep message. Because it's those places, and you have some. I love the sculpture over in Kisi Square. I just think that's one of the great sculptures that I've seen uh, anywhere, because of the, it's a very human type of sculpture. Uh, and I sort of like the woman sitting over here too a little bit, because you can sit down next to her. Uh, so that's what people remember. It's in their gut, it's in their soul. And if you don't have those places, you're, it's a big loss. And you can get a lot more. So the whole idea of placemaking is getting those to become part of your life and to feel those as part of your city more and more. And you do have a city that is really bright for much more of this. It really is. Uh, the scale of it is wonderful. The kind of compactness of various parts of it. Uh, it's a very good place. Obviously, you have a very difficult problem, and that has to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with quite aggressively. Uh, it's, what you have is you have a situation where some parts of the downtown have been taken away and privatized by certain limited types of use. The, the people who are the travelers, is that the term they use? Yeah. And that's not, the, well, they're transients and they're homeless. And, and then when they dominate and they control and they own, that's not your future. You can't have that. Uh, and what a good place is, it's available to everyone. But no dominant group. And that's when you start losing. So you're in a, you've lost something very precious to you. And you've got to get that back. And there's strategies that really we're going to show you, because we've dealt with this in many, many parts of the world. And, uh, and it's, it, it really requires something very strong to do it, but you have to be very sensitive at the same time, because it, everyone is precious. And, uh, and by doing this, you can actually come up with something for everyone, and everyone will feel uh, good about it and part of the solution. So that's what we're going to talk a lot about. So uh, the day after tomorrow, this big conference of 32,000 people starts in Quito, and uh, Dr. Close is the director of this habitat. And he's been asking, and for the last three years we've been working on this as one of many people, but what is the new paradigm for the postmodern city? So that's the question that we all have to deal with here. There is a new paradigm for a city, 
And it's really about places and public space and sense of place and local ownership and, and those issues worldwide. And, uh, uh, and so the idea of place or placemaking is that idea. And how it can, and, and think of Eugene as this mobilize communities, cities, and countries to define their future. So it could mobilize uh, Eugene, but the, the county here, and smaller communities around it. It can have purpose and foundation to people's lives. It creates ownership and shared value. It supports local innovation and entrepreneurship. It allows wisdom and common sense to thrive. It is community-based, holistic, and inclusive, and positive outcomes can be enormous and be done quickly. And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, any quick questions or anything? Is this, we got to start? So today, communities are defined by individual institutions, buildings, and parking lots. And that's not the future. Uh, the future is having all of these become more multi-use, even parks. We don't use the word park. We talk about gathering places or squares, uh, markets, not just, it shouldn't be just a food market, it should be multi-use. Many functions going on. So each one of these, the, like even the city hall, you need to put that up here, shouldn't be a building, it's about a larger idea of a place, where there may be some physical structure in there, but the larger idea is how the community uh, participates in the kind of, may, the uh, city functions as part of the city, as a city hall. So, Placemaking is not a discipline. Uh, it aligns the assets and aspirations of communities, creating and defining their future. And it increasingly becomes the places where we choose to live and work. This is something that's, a, that's exploding all over the world. People realize that place is an important part of their lives. And it's a, a, a deep need that has really come out of the last 70 years where we've focused around silos and disciplines, not around places. And communities. And there's also this convergence going on. And this is really fascinating that place enhances or allows like climate change and sustainability to be more effective. It gets, it gets the, these movements out of their silos because place brings them all together. So arts and culture, architecture and design, equity, community engagement, local economies, public health, preservation, transportation, food systems all can be enhanced enormously by the idea of place. So making it happen, how do we create the city of the future? So placemaking is a community process. It's natural, organic, it localizes, it's economic development, it scales each community, creates social and place capital, and the outcomes are much like what I just told you, but it's that process that is a critical part of this. We did it last night. People who were part of that, it's fantastic. Uh, you've got extraordinarily good people here. You're the experts. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with people that we worked with last night. They're brilliant, fantastic, caring people. And we have some really good ideas. Uh, the benefits of a place, and this is, uh, there's a lot of words here, and you know, we, we'll get this to you, but it's, you know, how it, Draws a more diverse population, a good place does. It fosters more frequent and meaningful interaction. It nurtures and defines community identity. It builds support in the local economy. Uh, creates improved accessibility. Promotes public health and comfort. Uh, so these are big impacts. And if you were to say, say, this is our goal, is to do all of these things, and that's our, our goal for the city of the future, you would be accomplishing a lot. Really, really big impacts. I mean, you could read one of them, pick one and look at it a little bit, and you'll see, you know, like uh, frequent and meaningful interactions, improved sociability, cultural exposure and interaction, exchange and preservation of information, wisdom and values, bol bolstered barter system, reduced race and class barriers, feeling of interconnections. Those are all qualities that we all want. So, we have to turn everything upside down to get it right side up to get from inadequate to extraordinary. And that has been our mantra for a long time. And it's really exciting to think that way because the future is very bright. Uh, we've, been, we've been in governments that are siloed around disciplines that have developed their own agendas that they promote, they define the, the agencies within government. 
and, um, and they deliver their product. We're turning it upside down, the community defines the outcome. So I'm going to show you some things where we look at these project-driven, design-led, discipline-led, and the lack of return, that you don't get the outcomes that you really are looking for. But as you move towards uh, more uh, community engagement and more place-led, you start to increase the impact and the, and the effectiveness of those places. So this is a place we were working in in, in Perth, and uh, there's a uh, state library and a museum, natural history museum, an art gallery, a, a performing arts center, and some cultural facilities, and the train station's right here. And then there's a, a, an institute up here, a technology institute. Uh, so this library is very big, and it's for the whole western, of Aus western Australia. And the woman there, as she got involved in this, she actually took all the public uses the library uses off of the ground floor of the library and put them on the mezzanine mm -hmm. and on the second floor and turned the ground floor over to become a public space uh, for this whole community, an inside public space. So there's the this site. And uh, the, we did an activation plan in 2009. We came back two years later. And they didn't do anything that was on the plan. That, that we left them with. And it was actually, they did much better. Because <coughs> what, by getting them to this point, they had come from really a dead area to something with a lot of life to it. And when we were there first, all these institutions, they really weren't involved at all. They'd come to a meeting and have their arms folded, and they didn't really feel like they wanted to do it. When we came back, they were all excited. They wanted to do a lot more. And uh, so, this is a before, and these are brutalist buildings. Concrete, ugly, I've seen a few here. Yeah. Uh, but what's so interesting is that when you start doing this, which is the after, the buildings disappear. And it's all about, all about the people and what they're doing. And you don't see the buildings anymore, so which is great. Uh, and this, you know, this is just an empty pit. Uh, but then the best thing about this is a guy who's a television personality who ran a, a garden type show, he was the one that kind of came up with this and helped implement it, but he turned it into that, which just blew my mind. You know, it was just beyond anything I would have imagined. So the creative energy that happens because of this kind of iterative approach, things started to get better and better. And then uh, this area was where most of the homeless were, uh, living under the trees, and it was a you know, not a good place at all. And so they came up with this garden and farm stand, and, and it became a, a very busy place for, for that. I wouldn't have done that, but that's what they did. So it's not what we, what we think, it's what they think, and then what they own and they do together to make it happen. And then they go there to be there, because they did it. So, uh, and then this building is the art museum, and this is the stuff they put all around the art museum. So now the art museum, you know, is there, but you don't think of it as a building anymore because everything else around you is going on and you go there all the time. So uh, the strategies for implementation are three, there's more, but I've break, broken it down to three. You create these energetic anchors of activity using the power of 10, we'll talk about that, you bring the inside out, get life on the streets and walkways, and then lighter, quicker, cheaper. And short term is one to four months, and long term is two years. I may even think that may be a little too long. Uh, but uh, by doing this, you set agendas that have an impact quickly. You don't do a lot of planning, uh, don't do master plans, do placemaking plans, placemaking visions, placemaking activation. Uh, and you can get things to happen, and you can do it quickly, and you'll see what I mean by that. So, the city, and if you take this and forget that this is New York, and you think of this as Eugene, and say this is Eugene going up under the hill up there, in the train station, these are your places. And, and then this is one of those places, and that could be a park block, 
and this could be one place within the park block. So coming back to uh, New York, this is Bryant Park, this is Times Square, this is Washington Square, Rockefeller Center, um, not sure, probably Central Park. Uh, and so those are the places. And when we started working 40 years ago, none of these were good destinations. They were all pretty terrible places. Bryant Park had nine groups of people dealing in drugs. It was a terrible, terrible place. The Port Authority bus terminal was a hellhole. And, uh, and, the, and we worked on those. And we did the plan for Bryant Park. And uh, Bryant Park uh, was then implemented. And it has grown to be probably the most effectively managed public space anywhere in the world. And if you break it down into the destinations, uh, no, these are all distinctly different destinations, all of which provide something to do. And they didn't kick out the homeless. There are still people who come there every day and make that their home. And it's, and it's part of that community. So everyone shares it. No one is excluded. They, but they are told that they can't bring a lot of bags and bikes so that they have some rules that they have to uh, adhere to. <clears throat> and then one place uh, is a little Southwest Airlines uh, gathering place, uh, ping pong, and all these other things. And, all, and this is in one area where there's a fountain and, and that. So there, there's 10 things to do uh, at times, 20 places. And that's, you go there for the things to do. You don't go because it looks good. You go because you want to do something. So you got to get out of the design mode where design is as an object. And, and you build these objects around the city of Eugene, you need places. And instead of calling them buildings, you need sort of a library place, a city hall place, instead of a building. Because it's the place and what goes on in that place that makes it work for you. So in Atlanta, in Midtown, and this is what you're doing, uh, people were given, it's a fairly large area, quite a bit bigger than here, but people were given as many green dots and red dots and yellow dots as they wanted, the stakeholders, and they started putting them on. So when you look at this, there's a few green areas. This area is green, and this one here. But other than that, there are really no green areas. But look at all the yellow and red. So when you look at that and you compile this, and then you take the next step and you put them into clusters, as to where you can work and where you can focus your attention around these places, that's where you go to work. So it's place-led. It goes back to you know, what we were doing in Perth. There's a, a big cultural center, which is right here. And they can really have a big impact by diversifying the uses and creating a multi-use place, where part of it is the cultural facilities that people go to. <coughs> so Bryant Park was one of the places that we worked in the beginning. And as I said, there were nine groups of people dealing in drugs. It was really bad. Not nine people, nine groups of people. And we did activity mapping. And we actually did activity mapping uh, identifying different types of drugs that were being sold. So it was even broken down into that, and male and female, and age and all that stuff. So uh, this is a before and after. You know, it's a pretty dramatic change. Uh, and there's a much bigger story here that I'm not going to get into, this before and after. And then what happens is, as they kept doing the management, and, and we didn't do this, this was, was done by the management entity, is they broke this down into all these destinations, and some of them are multi-use. And so uh, I'm not going to show a lot of pictures of this, but this is why people go, because of those things that are going on there. And, uh, you know, these are just one. And then in the winter time, they have also a whole program. It almost sometimes I think it's almost busier in the winter time than it is in the summer. And this is what it looks like in the winter. So this is big and big impact. And the value of the properties around this are, are it's the highest rent for any office space in New York City around here. Now that's not necessarily good, but I mean that's what's happening. And, and this is not my favorite place. Union Square is my favorite place because it's edgy. It has all kinds of people. There are a lot of pretty weird people that make it interesting. 
Uh, you don't, you can't go in there and be weird. You got to be closer to normal. Uh, so it doesn't tell you that. I mean, it tells you that by what it lets you do. But Union Square lets you be weird. And that's a kind of nice way for cities to be. So you don't want to get to the perfect thing where you only get people who are normal. You want to get places where people get stretched and excited about the diversity of who's in this place. So, uh, now, any questions? We're, we're okay right now? So this is what I think is like your park box. I would change the name park to square because you really need a central square in the city. You don't have one. Uh, and so this is a wonderful one. And it was, uh, they used to have a market in Market Square. It's a pretty good idea to have a market in Market Square. Uh, we were working in, uh, in Houston, and we were working on a park that was called Market Square. And we suggested a market on Market Square. But it was a park, so we couldn't put a market on Market Square, even though it was called Market Square. You know, it was a little weird. So, uh, so this is what it was like, and then they, they took the market building down, and then this is the, and then the iteration that we worked on is this. And uh, we uh, broke that down into different places, and uh, in this case it was 12, and we did a program for each of those spaces. So each quadrant had its own program, and the edge uses were part of that. So it was like that, like that, like that. So if you think of your park blocks, you know, your park blocks could be these two spaces. But if these become more square-like and more multi-use, you can bring a lot more different kinds of activities into that place. And it's the edge uses that are important. And this is a nighttime program and a wintertime. I think, you know, this is the... I guess that's a nice for her, but so you can do morning, noon, and night. And so this is the result. And, uh, and then the edge uses, the inner square and the outer square, you have a problem because you have a big wide asphalt area and then a building and parking, parking and then a buildings. None of them have any participation in the, in the larger, in the center. So by doing that and using, having all the edge use activated and how they participate or they, how they connect to the activities in the middle, and you can get to think of places like this that are just exceptional and are true heart of a community. And you need that heart of a community. And your park blocks have got to change. They are not your future the way they are now. Uh, green is a very good thing. Uh, if you know Pioneer Courthouse Square in, uh, in uh, Portland, that's a park. There's no grass. It's a square. It's really a square. And it functions like a square. So that's a good model to look at. I, uh, Occidental Park up in Seattle had tremendously difficult problems, and they've now kind of conquered that, and it's a really good place to look. The woman who's doing that, Karen True, we should get down here because she's a gem at being able to draw people in and make it multi-use. Uh, so she has a very good story. Uh, and what happened is because Market Square became so prominent, it started to create octopus effect where other things around it started to fill in and, and, and be enhanced because so many people were coming to Market Square. So it's a very, very big impact. It's transformative for the city. Uh, Martin, you'll be there on Sunday, I guess, right? Maybe. Maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> so and then Detroit, this was a game changer for us because um, Detroit, Detroit uh, basically had no government, and so it was easy to work there. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so uh, this is the downtown core, and it was pretty much empty uh, about 15 years ago when we first started working there. Uh, the buildings were empty, it had been vacated. Uh, this is the, the area we've, we've been working in all the public spaces, these destinations, Eastern Market, all of them. But the core areas, I'm going to show you something about the core area, which is important. Uh, but in about 1917, um, this was the Soldiers and Sailors Monument right there. Okay? That was the center of Detroit. Remember that. 
In 2000, that monument did not move. Then it got to that. Totally, totally vacant. The whole area. This was what used to be Woody's, uh, which was the largest department store in the world, anywhere. And so we did a plan to create what is called campus marshes. I'm not going to show that. Uh, but this is the result in 2013, after we did an activation plan for, for this. But what I'm going to show you is this area right here. This is a beach. And the beach was put in by our partner of ours that we were all over the country with, Southwest Airlines. We put it in, had $100,000 to do an activation in the center of Detroit <laughs> and this place. So uh, this was amazing. Now what's most amazing is what I learned earlier last month. is a good friend who does the managing all the public spaces had uh, taken this, uh, this beach and he turned it into a multi-use destination about the size of a piece of script. So he broke it down into you know, a lounge, a bar, a beer garden, and, uh, beach chairs, dining tables, uh, communal tables, sand games, beach chairs, and sculpture. So that each area had its own set of uses. And so he was able to program it in the morning differently than at lunchtime, and differently than in the afternoon, and then at night. So it's, it goes all day into the night. And, uh, and so this is what it is. It brings people out of the buildings, uh, and uh, games, and it's just a joy to be there. And it brings, it's, it's a very successful place. Uh, and uh, this is Dan Gilbert, uh, who's playing the piano outside in the public space with a friend. So everyone participates in this. And Dan Gilbert, is, uh, his whole philosophy is about place and placemaking. Inside the buildings and outside, he's bought 85 buildings and is retrofitting them and is making a city like we've never seen in five years. He's three years into it and it's gone, gone amazing. So you need the same campaign. You need to be absolutely focused on transforming the city around the concept of place in the downtown and in the neighborhoods. Uh, it is a powerful opportunity that you have and when you desperately need because of some of the social issues you have. And the opportunities you have are absolutely enormous. So the thing about what I just showed you is a lot of people like to order and control and limit uh, complexity, but it's the complexity which is what brings people. So one of my teachers, you know, when she was with, we worked, she was in our sphere when we were working with Holly White. So intricate minglings of different uses in cities are not a form of chaos. On the contrary, they represent a complex and highly developed form of order. So it's that order that is kind of missing here. And making that order have an influence on the whole space, making it more diverse, more accessible to everyone, is what is going to make this place truly great. So now we're going to do the inside out. Okay, uh, we we have what we call. We don't believe in complete streets. Uh, we believe in streets that are places, that are multi-use, that create a sense of place. And uh, going back to our bookstore. There are 10 things to do there. It's a great part of a place. If you have 10 of these places on a street, you have a great street. You don't have very many places on your street to do this. So you can make it. This is not easy to do, but it's obvious you'll do much better if you do it. Your business will thrive if you do it. So when you design your community around cars, traffic, you get more cars and traffic. And that's what the transportation professional has been doing for 70 years. And it has not given you the kind of community you really want to live in, or, or know you want to live in when you know the alternative. So when you design your community around people and places, you get more people and places. So this is a friend who died, unfortunately. But he was a traffic engineer, the ultimate friend. He 
uh, was very quantitative. He did a lot of data analysis. And he looked at intersections, accidents, and, and uh, injuries. And he would say that a place like this was just a disaster. But a place like this, which has all kinds of interactions going on, is the way to go. So he said the only way to make a busy road intersection safe is to make it feel dangerous. Um, uh, and so he took this intersection here and he turned it into this one. Took out all the lights, stop signs, and uh, what happened is, and you have one right out here. You know, this, uh, you have one where the, the surface is all flat. It's almost a shared space. It feels shared. You, you watch yourself when you go there, how you walk across it and what you look at. You almost have one here. It would be much better if you did. And if you did some others, I'm going to show you something very powerful that can have a big impact on the city. So uh, what happens is, uh, if you're walking on a bike, his whole purpose as an engineer was to create eye contact between the vehicle and the pedestrian or bicyclist so that they, they recognize each other and they nod and they agree who goes. So it is a social a way of connecting socially. And that happens out there. It's a very good intersection from a traffic point of view. So what happened when they did this is that the total accidents and injuries was, uh, that wasn't a lot, but when afterwards, it got down to very little at all. So it actually became safer, even though it felt more dangerous, because people had to, con they had to connect with other people before they went through. And, they, and we were standing there, and uh, this man, this bu bus stop with, with my, uh, uh, Mr. Donovan, and, uh, and the bus driver leaned out, and he said, uh, saw him, and he said, thank you, Mr. Donovan. Uh, you have made my life much better and easier. So everyone, it worked for everyone, that kind of idea. So uh, now, uh, we have a guy that we hired. Uh, we, we, did tra we trained a lot of traffic, we trained a lot of traffic engineers around the world. And this is the, the guy who's re responsible for us getting into that because he was running scope development and planning for the entire state of New Jersey. And uh, he was beginning to realize that what he was doing was not what he should be doing for the communities. So we went in, we were shortlisted, we went in and uh, we don't usually get work from government agencies, and I didn't think we were going to get this. So the first thing I said when we sat down was, you know, whatever a traffic engineer says, we suggest you do the opposite and you'll build your community. We got the job. <laughs> that was amazing. And so we trained most of the traffic engineers, and then he now works with us. And we took him to uh, Mr. Monderman and that place, and we put him out in the middle of this intersection that has 17,000 vehicles per day. And, uh, you know, there he is standing, and uh, this truck coming along in there, and, ah, oh, okay, he's still there. So then, we got a little boy bigger, we put him in a chair. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there he is, he's really nervous. Uh, you know, here's a traffic engineer that spent his whole life trying to improve the capacity of intersections and all of that, and there he is. And, uh, He's still alive, and he's doing wonderful work. It changed, it changed his life, because he sees the potential of place, and how place creates the kind of outcome you want. So, you know, with exactly what this means, and this is really, really important, is the transfer of power and responsibility from the state to the individual and the community. The eye contact, the nodding, the connection. So you can do that. There are quite a few places in the downtown here, and it will change. So now, the next big idea. So here, how do you create a square at an intersection? And uh, this is a place in Buenos Aires, and we were sitting here, or here, having lunch, and we began to notice that the traffic was going slower. It started out with two lanes going two different directions. And then, as more and more people came, uh, it got uh, busier, and see how close the, the seating is. The, these are really, it's a great square. The whole square is occupied by people. Um, and uh, it got so busy that uh, someone came along selling balloons, had to walk in the street, 
because you couldn't walk on the sidewalk. And then uh, instead of those bollards being bollards, they became places to sit and someone else came. A quirky guy came along. And so the whole place became a human gathering place, which to me, you could do right down here where Starbucks is and food, and you could bring that out and give the whole place a much stronger aura of diverse uses and a lot of cafe seating and a lot of activity. And, uh, and then the square, I'll come back to the square a little bit later. So, so that's the streets. So the streets are a big deal. And they can be brought into compliance with what a downtown needs for the future. And now the lighter trip are cheaper. These are three that I, there, there's so many out there. And, and there's some around here, I think there's uh, someone that's talking about one. And, City, neighboring city. So, but I thought that this is to me the best thing I've ever seen because this is the back of a building. Those are all bricks. Something that happened here, I guess it got taken out. So, this friend of ours, 40 years ago, he took that back and he did that. So, the, this is paint. This is all paint. Okay? Yeah. Look at that. See? Uh -huh. um, Okay. Yeah, cool. So, uh, but then he just put garage structures in there and gave uh, some artists, uh, got artists to design the storefronts, and they put in 60 businesses. And uh, it's still operating 40 years later. It's a great public space with very low rents, and the people that came into it were, were uh, beginning businesses, and so they created their lives in places like this. I think it's really yeah. It's yeah, and then we like this one because uh, it has a fence, but I'm not. I don't don't look at that in any particular way. Um, it's there, but this one is really very complex and very diverse. This is they have a garden area. They have a place to sit and you can get food. There's all these food uh, areas. There are all these little uh, quarter sized containers where they put in an Etsy market. They have a music venue up on the left. Uh, it's one of the most social places that, in New York. It was actually, I thought of it as the best public space in New York when it was there for two years. And then the developer that owned the land did that, took it away. So it was temporary. So you can do something like this, where I would do it. I would do it on a park lot. Because <laughs> it's a public space that would bring lots of people in a very good way. With an incubator type business, and you turn the park blocks into squares, you would then have a very multi-use and destination. So, and then this, we were looking at all, all the cities around the Baltic summer, and uh, when you get out of the, these historic tourist areas, there are some amazing creative things going on. And this is one we've been bringing a lot that day. But, you know, just look at that. It's fantastic. Uh, and the kind of creativity, we've seen a lot of this in a lot of places. So this is just one that caught my particular fancy uh, because it was so engaging. Uh, and that would be working all the time, day and night. So, and this is something that I studied with her. Uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so that's our message to you all, is as a, as a focus on place, and we have this phrase that the community is the expert in the book we did. Uh, you can have an enormous impact on your future. In fact, it's the only way to do it. It can't be top-down, government-led. It just doesn't work. The outcomes never get to be. You get to mediocrity very fast. But to get to excellence is by doing this kind of lighter, quicker, cheaper, and keep moving up the ladder as you get to see what it is and to make it better. So, Meg, you might want to explain this. I think, you know, this is, you're all involved in this. Yes, but we're, we're also giving you the opportunity to do this exercise. This is our Power of Ten exercise. So 
to identify <coughs> what you think are the favorite destinations in the downtown, and then those that uh, have the most potential. And so what's interesting about this is the ones that are the, the top three or four are both the favorite destinations and the most potential. So number one was the, and, and those are the circles with the, uh, yellow circles with blue around them. Um, I think some of you are already doing this out here. I don't want to give this away. You may have other places. I hope you do. But number one, um, this is what we did in August when we came and we did a, a, a number of, um, uh, we did some pop-up placemaking stations and we had uh, meetings with um, uh, stakeholders and we did this exercise with them. So number one was the Eugene Public Library, but it also has the most potential. <laughs> Second favorite was Halt Performing Arts Center, and it also has the most potential. And then three was Kesey Square, and four was Broadway and Pearl. And then there were a number of others. I mean, in things people even mentioned like the Credit Union or uh, the Atrium Building, um, Shed Institute, Kiva Grocery Store, the Makoto Japanese Restaurant. So <laughs> some people's favorite destinations were, you know, the restaurant that they love to go to for lunch every day. So that's, and, and others folks, you know, mentioned the riverfront is a um, real potential uh, destination. So this is kind of how we do the power of 10 with communities when we first come in, so we get to understand what it is they love about their community, what, what they love about their city. And you find sometimes the oddest things, but this is a good way to learn when you're, when you're from the outside and you don't know anything. So you are going to do this as well, along with some other exercises out there. Um, and uh, I guess that's what you yep. wanted me to explain. So, that, uh, so, so I was with uh, a group that was looking at uh, at Chrissy Square. We better tell them what we did last night. Oh, we did a workshop last night, a placemaking workshop. And we can tell you more about this. I happened to be staying in the uh, Hilton Hotel. And I think very strongly that you should build the city hall place to be right here. Right? Place. I didn't say building, I said place. Okay? <laughs> Remember, you're not building buildings anymore, you're building places. There may be some physical aspects of that, but concept is a place. So it has many uses, but they're public uses. You see. What's happened in government is that the city halls have just become about their business, not about the larger idea of how the community participates in, their, in the city's future. So you can put those anywhere. You can put them underground. You know, it's not nice, but you could. Um, so, and, and the park blocks could be part of this place and become part of the venue, the kind of square that a, city, a great city hall has. Now, you wouldn't take out the trees. I mean, those are wonderful. But you might change the uses at the ground level and create the market to be sort of woven here. And by narrowing the street, you're going too away with the street. But the street, the lanes are still too wide. And you can do a shared space between them. And that would be make that whole area your central square, your major destination that everyone knows. And they love it because there's so much going on there. So that's, I think that's your future. Uh, and then this, to me, is so exciting. Because if you take this, maybe around here, and you bring this out, I have a couple, I think I have some pictures of this, not the right picture, but, you know, and these doors open, but why not have it all open? Why not have some of the books coming out in the cafe, and have it bigger, and have outdoor seating here? I know you did that once, but the stronger this is, the more impact it has on that place. And then this guy, character. And he's, uh, I would say he's lovable. And what he wants to do is terrific. Tell people where, this is new. Yeah, this is right across the street from the library. It's right over there in the corner. But you, but at first I was, he said, well, I asked him, well, what about having two other kiosks there? And he said, no, no, I don't want that. I want the whole place. <laughs> then I told him about, if you have a, a market and you have one fishmonger in the market, you'll get so much business. If you have two, you'll get more business and a little more than just what each one of you would have brought. And when you get three, you're starting to be the main destination for buying fish. 
And people get competitive, they come down and they have their favorite fishmonger and they come back on a regular basis. So it's the same thing here. You can build these three triangulations, what we call it, and he bought it right away. He's, and he has a lot of ideas. And so he's, a, he's a, an incubator, he's an innovator. Uh, a new innovation district is right there, across the street. Okay, and uh, and then this is the <laughs> <your> square. <laughs> so, uh, so and this is really I love this sculpture. I really, really love it. I think it's just so gentle, and, you know, so wonderful. And and those are great. The, the people in the, run those foods are really good. Uh, and you can get to know them immediately. Go back. Uh, but um, what the group I was with last night, they were talking about how could you take and create perhaps a structure for the wintertime when it rains. And they also wanted to create awnings off of that and maybe even a deck up above. If you look at. So I found a few pictures uh, last night. And here's a structure. Now, whoops, sorry is a structure. But that structure has this. So you can actually roll it up when, it, when it's raining. And because you don't get cold weather here, you could be using this year round. So some kind of a structure would be good. And I thought that was an example. And here's another one. Uh, you know, I don't think that's quite right, but it shows you what you can do. And this one has, you know, it rolls down. So you can do that. And this is up in Stockholm, and it's, it's open Actually, this part of it's open all year round. And another one like that. And then this, I thought, was spectacular. But I'd never seen anything that's kind of a clear, uh, opaque, a clear uh, surface so you could get light in there in the wintertime. You know, would you make it look like that? I don't think so. But uh, that was just another idea. And then the people who were talking about how do you have a canopy coming out so you can get under shade around the edge of it. And, and this is really quite an interesting one. And what happens to this one is that when they want more light, they open up these louvers and then they close it up. So, you know, that, so our, what we do is we, when you come up with some ideas, we might find four or five places where that idea has been tried and that will give you clarity and then you'll be able to take the ideas a little further and you'll start to get your vision together and then you find a way to implement it in a lighter, quicker, cheaper way, and you've got a future for that place. And that place can be dynamite, and it's low-hanging fruit, right? Right. Right. So, and the people who were doing it were awesome. And they were great. As were every, as everyone. So we're really happy to be here, and we love this community, we love the kind of energy that's here, and we know that this place can really become spectacular. Uh, so remember, you have to turn it upside down though. to get it right side up. You have to get from inadequate to extraordinary. And it's not easy to do that. Uh, and it's a campaign. Uh, vision, communicate it, search for impediments, organize strong teams, attack complacency, produce short-term winners, take on bigger challenges, and connect change to the culture of the community. And that's it. So, Thank you.